This week, we have with us Dr. Paul Chambers. I was incredibly excited to interview Dr. Chambers because I did use a lot of his articles and a couple of his books when I was researching the episode on Thailand. In the episode itself, we look at the military structure and organization of Thailand, how the military interacts with the monarchy, and why the military plays a central role in Thai politics, and what that means to the protests that are going on today and the incumbent premiership of Prayut Chan Ocha. Here's the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today, sir. It's a pleasure to be here. I think I want to start with something that is slightly broad and overarching. Um, how would you describe the role of the Thai military in the political sphere today, and how has it evolved since perhaps 1992, post the Cold War era? Well, Thailand's military has always been a major player on the political landscape, but you know, it has always been sort of a second fiddle to the monarchy. Uh, and as such, we might see the military in a sort of relationship with the monarchy, a sort of an asymmetrical relationship where the military is the junior partner. All right. Okay. And to make it, it maybe longer, I mean, you can see the power of the military growing ever since uh, 1932 with the end of absolute monarchy. But needless to say, the military was always guarding and protecting the role, the power of the monarchy to help the monarchy, but also to help the military's own interests. Uh, and since 1992, things have changed somewhat because in 1992, there was a massacre of uh, civilians and uh, the military, uh, you know, was a, a bloody culprit in that massacre. Uh, we can say that, uh, you know, before 1992, the media had not been able to capture uh, on television or on radio, uh, you know, examples of the, of the military acting in such a bloody way. But in 1992, the media did do so. And this tainted or tarnished the image of the military, both in the domestic realm, as well as for the international community. And this, also, this thus allowed a, a long 14 year period of civilian control over the military, although it was a guided democracy to the extent that the monarchy still was supreme over this sort of a civilian rule period, okay? Uh, but needless to say, with the military having returned to the barracks, so to speak, in 1992, military had played, continued to play a major role in the background. Um, however, then in 2006, there was another military coup, which brought the military to the foreground. And again, in 2014, another coup. So today, uh, you know, we, the military is very, very powerful, working with monarchy in this asymmetrical partnership that I told you about. And the person who came into power after the 2014 coup, which is General Prayut Chan O Chan, is the current premier in Thailand as well. Does he still retain yeah. some amount of control in the military, or is the military now a distinct entity from Prayut Chan O Chan's political party? Well, Prayut Chan O Chan was the army commander who led the coup of 2014, but he was never a, a general who exerted quite a lot of command or power over that military, okay? Uh, his deputy junta leader, Prawit Wongsawan, was much more, was more powerful than Prayut, you know? And so, you know, in the junta led by Prayut from 2014 to 2019, Prayut was the junta leader, but also he was the, uh, the prime minister and head of the cabinet, okay? His deputy junta leader and deputy cabinet, deputy cabinet, uh, sorry, deputy prime minister was this other general, 
Prawit Wong So On. So the two of them dominated the uh, military, specifically Prawit did, but dominated the cabinet. And uh, since 2019, we've seen the end of the military junta, but this sort of a democracy that exists today in Thailand is a charade democracy because the political party that was created by the junta is a proxy military party in which some might say it's the continuation of junta power by other means, by a sort of a charade democracy means, okay? And that's why today, specifically tomorrow, there's going to be this big demonstration by students, protesters in Bangkok who are tired and fed up with this military charade power behind what appears to be a democracy. Uh, Prayut, yes, is the prime minister. Prawit is his deputy. Uh, also, the protesters are angry at the way in which the new monarch has endorsed the continuation of uh, authoritarian or similar to authoritarian rule in Thailand. All right. Um, but in terms of the structure of the military, how is the military or the Thai Royal Armed Forces structured in Thailand? As in, is there an army, a navy, and an air force as a conventional across military regimes? And how did they interact with one another? Well, okay, the uh, military is, um, okay, there's an army, there's an air force, there's a navy, and the army uh, enjoys the lion's share of power. Uh, and that can be measured in terms of the budget. Yeah. So if you look at, at <laughs> how much of the budget the army receives in comparison to the Navy and the Air Force, it's hands down the army, okay? And so the army is extremely powerful. Well, how is it organized? There are four regions, four army regions. Uh, army region one, which uh, looks after Bangkok and Central Plains. Then there is army region two, which has been powerful in the past, but it looks after the rural Northeast. Then there is Army Region 3, which is in charge of the North, which has been important for the Thai-Lao and Thai-Burmese border. A lot of narcotics have passed through there. So that's important. And finally, what's becoming more important is Army Region 4, which is, which is the charged with the southern part of Thailand. Southern part of Thailand is where there is an ongoing insurgency, okay? Specifically since 2004, since that insurgency became exacerbated. Um, these army regions work together uh, also with another important unit called Special Forces, which is a Special Forces unit is uh, headquartered also in central Thailand. Uh, there are other important units, the uh, artillery unit, the anti-aircraft unit, the et cetera, et cetera, okay. Um, but the four regions are most significant, okay. And these, these units of the army, uh, these regions, they work under ultimately uh, the central command of the army. Um, which is based in Bangkok, okay? Now, you can see similarities with the, the Army structure in the Navy and in the Air Force, okay? Um, but as I said before, the Army is the most important. Region 1 is very important for preventing and sometimes staging military coups. So whoever is the head of region one is very important. Okay. Um, now what's gonna happen on Saturday is this huge demonstration uh, by students and others. And so it's very important that region one 
is ready to withstand any chaotic protests and protect the prime minister and also the palace. All right. So, so that's kind of in, in summary sort of what the organization is like. <laughs> All right, that makes sense. So it's specifically region one that carried out or might be held most responsible for the bloody massacre of 1992 as well as 2010? Yes, and to 1976 and 1973. Yeah. All right, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you spoke a bit about the military acting as a means and a conduit to protect the monarchy. What specifically yeah. is the interaction between the military and the monarchy and how might that have evolved over time? So has the military ever taken the foreground and has controlled what the monarch wants or does the monarchy still exert control over the military? Yeah, well, there have been changes over time. So with the fall of the absolute monarchy in 1932, the military became the dominant player in Thai politics. Um, and that continued up until about 1948. And then from 1948 to 1951, the military needed with help from the monarchy for legitimacy, okay? But then the military got tired of having to work with the monarchy again. So there was this coup and the military came back to monopolize power alone. And then in 1957, there was another coup. And here again, the military was working with the monarchy, but the monarchy was the junior partner. And this situation lasted until 1970, I guess, 73. And then 1973, the military's image was tarnished. And there was a massacre of people and the monarchy's power grew again, okay? But in 1976, another massacre occurred and the monarchy's uh, power grew even further and the king thought that he could appoint the prime minister and didn't need any help from the military. Well, that didn't last, but maybe for a year. In 1977, another coup. And this coup brought, <laughs> yes, Thailand is the country that probably has the Guinness Book of World Records of coups. The, uh, the, <laughs> the military leader who came to power in 1977 did not even have the endorsement of the monarchy. And so, there was a very three years of military power in which the monarchy was very upset. Then in 1980, 1980 is a very important year because there was rather a silent coup, I like to say, in which the defense minister and army commander, one and the same person, uh, working with the king, met with the military prime minister and that military prime minister after pressure, retired, resigned, and this new defense, this new prime minister came to office, the prime minister, the defense minister, who's the, and his name was Prem Tenasulanon, General Prem, and Prem was extremely arch royalist, and he, it was he who perhaps more than anybody, more than any general wanted to see the military be the junior partner to the monarchy. And thus began this period in 19, beginning in 1980, where you see this asymmetrical partnership between monarchy and military, which was to last uh, until today. Uh, the military needs the monarchy for its legitimacy, but the monarchy needs the military for its protection. Uh, and that has continued on and on. However, what's changed is that in 2016, the uh, King Bumipon Adunya that died, passed away, and uh, the son uh, has not been as hmm, popular. Um, at the same time, uh, the military has uh, been more difficult to control. Okay, and this leads us to another interesting chapter in monarchy military relations, which I'm happy to talk about if you want. Yeah, of course.
<laughs> so, uh, those are my rhetorical questions. Okay. The, uh, <laughs> um, so what's happened is since 2016 is that the, where once upon a time, the sovereign would sort of try to balance out factions and maybe find a faction of the military that was very close to monarchy, which was Prim's faction, by the way. The new sovereign has sought to personalize control over the military, direct personal control. How has he done that? Well, in one aspect, he has placed some units of the military directly under palace control so that they report directly to the palace, not through the military and then into the palace. That's interesting. That's sort of like returning to some dark days of absolute monarchy, okay? Second, the military units, certain many military units have been moved out of Bangkok except for the ones under direct palace control. Okay, that means that uh, any military uh, units in Bangkok are going to answer to his majesty directly. Okay, uh, others will be moved out and farther away, so not to bother the king, okay. And uh, there have been other changes. For example, the faction of Prayut Chanocha, which is the Eastern Tigers faction, that faction naturally is based in Eastern Thailand, but there has been a unit created in Eastern Thailand that reports directly to the king, okay? So this is sort of a way to bring power of the uh, monarch's uh, chosen and most trusted units into the heart of, how would I say, enemy territory within the Thai military. Okay, um, you mentioned again, factions of the Thai military being created. These factions yeah. presumably don't always get along with one another. So what is the intra-faction relationship between the military like? Well, it depends on what kinds of factions you're talking about. There are unit factions. There are personal factions. There, are, there have been ideological factions. And there have been business factions. Okay. So, uh, but the most important types of factions and the ones I think you're talking about most likely are today are the unit factions. Okay. Oh, by the way, there's also graduating class factions, which are important, but they're still not as important as the unit factions today. So when I talk about the unit factions, specifically I'm talking about, for example, the uh, 21st Regiment uh, of the 2nd Infantry Division faction, which is the Eastern Tigers. That's the uh, the faction of Prayut, the Prime Minister, and his deputy, Prime Minister Prawit. And this faction dominated the Thai army from 2007 until 2016. Okay, that's a long time. Uh, and uh, prior to that, however, prior to 2006, the faction that was extremely dominant tended to be very dominant was the first division faction. And that was called the divine progeny faction. And that faction had been generally powerful for the previous hundred years. It was so powerful, okay? But the reason why that faction became less powerful is because when Prime Minister Thaksin Chinawat uh, became Prime Minister in 2001, he began to chisel his influence through the officer corps of that faction. And so by 2006, um, there were not that many senior officers in that faction who could lead a coup. And so there was only a coup 
that could be led from the uh, army officers of the Buddha Papayak, the Eastern Tigers faction. Now, the faction of the Eastern Tigers by 2016 um, was per powerful, but many officers, intermediate level officers, were getting a little tired, pissed off at this faction having so much power. Okay. And one person, though, who was most important was the son of the sovereign <laughs> who had actually served in the military, you know, honorarily leading certain units when he was younger. He had served in the first division, which is the faction opposed to <clears throat> the Eastern Tigers. And uh, so when he became king, he began to prop up other factions, okay? And so today, as king, uh, if you try to look at the top five military officers in the army, you're not going to find one from the Eastern Tigers. Not one, okay? Um, but not, not, nevertheless, there continues to be this jousting to some extent, between the new sovereign and the uh, deputy prime minister, Prawit Wongsawan. The, uh, so uh, you'll see the, uh, the latest, the newest um, reshuffle, which will be coming out next week, is going to have one member of Eastern Tigers in the, in the top five uh, senior officers, but the newest army commander, is from the first division, from the king's own. Okay, so um, there continues to be factionalism. Um, give, I can't probably say this, but given the fact that um, the newest sovereign has not quite consolidated his rule then there continues to be factionalism at top levels in Thailand, in the Thai military, in the Thai army. And uh, that will continue into the near future. Um, the sovereign is trying to create a new personalized army faction that will dominate all factions, but it's not succeeded yet. All right, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um... What about, and you've written about this a bit, what about the Thai Royal Police? Where does the Thai Royal Police factor into this conflict or the interaction between the army and the monarchy? Well, the Thai Royal Police are very important because if you count the number of army, of, of army officials and soldiers, it's almost, it's about the same number of police. <laughs> so the police are powerful and uh, people often forget how powerful they are. Um, well, uh, the police, you know, are sort of an alternative army. That's what I've called it in a, in a chapter I've written before. And in the past, the army and the police have come at loggerheads against each other. Okay, um, because the police can be used as a sort of an army. It's happened at least three times in the past. When Thaksin Chinawat was prime minister, he really tried to build up the police uh, who tended to be really loyal to him. Thaksin was a former police senior officer. Um, and under Yinglok Chinawat, Thaksin's sister, the police continued to be very important. In fact, when Yinglok was prime minister, she had the option of, so when she applied the emergency decree, she could use either army soldiers or police, and she opted to use the police, okay? So the police are important because they are sort of an alternative army. Um, civilian, elected civilians can use the police. They don't have to use the army. And, uh, but often when you use the police, instead of the army, the army's not very, very happy about that. And uh, <laughs> army commander Prayut was not happy about that. And he staged the coup. Let me tell you one thing that's kind of interesting is since the coup of 2014, um, 
General Prowit and General Prayud, they made some changes in the law so that henceforth uh, police officers must all answer to army officers and leading, arm, leading army officers and intermediate army officers can tell police what to do, okay? So what happens is you kind of have a hierarchy of security power where the police are weaker than the army, okay? And that's something, I guess you could say that the military coup of 2014 was the army's victory over the police. Yeah, that makes, uh, yeah, that, that does make a lot of sense owing to what the police looks like now in the, in the entire structure of Thai security. Um, is there a division of public sentiment towards the military and the police because they are two separate units, or is it just the same dissatisfaction that is venerated towards the police as well as it's done towards the army? I think people hate the police more than the army uh, because the police just have this image of corruption, human rights violations, uh, the army also has that perception. I mean, there's a perception that the army is that way too. It's just not seen as being as bad. Um, you know, there was a famous case in Thailand, happened about 1990, of these extremely corrupt police uh, who uh, kidnapped these uh, family of a diplomat from Saudi Arabia and they beat these people to death, uh, these diplomats, and stole jewelry from the uh, uh, family of the, ro the royal family of Saudi Arabia. Um, and the Saudi Arabian government has never gotten over this. And uh, of course they wouldn't, right? <laughs> these corrupt police. Uh, so the police, that's just an example. The police have this image in Thailand of being so terribly corrupt. Uh, so people don't tend to like them. And also I think because police, you know, they come to your home more likely than army officials. And some of them are demanding, you know, oh, you have to take care of the police if you want us to take care of you. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, yeah, police are seen in a more negative light than the army. Okay. And you've written extensively about civil military relationships, in particular, the necessity of civil control over the military for a functioning democracy. What does civil control on the military look like in Thailand or what should it look like in an ideal democracy? Well, I think you need to have uh, true civilians leading the military. And I think it comes down to that. What do I mean by true civilians? Well, I mean, it's possible to argue that Prayut is a civilian, that Prawit is a civilian. They retired, right? But we know, you and I, that the prime minister being a retired general is not a true civilian, okay? And uh, so sometimes it's really hard to ensure that there is civilian control, elected true civilian control over decision-making authority. Now that's what I'm really talking about, decision-making authority. Who has the power to make decisions in Thailand over what? Well, for example, we're talking about um, over public policy, right? We're talking about over military organization, okay? And when I talk about military organization, I'm talking about the military budget. So is it true civilians that are making decisions over the military budget? Or is it retired military masquerading as civilians who are deciding who's getting the military budget, right? Um, other areas, national defense. So who is deciding if we go out to war or not? Who is deciding 
whether there's going to be, you know, internal security decisions that are really under civilian control. Okay, these sorts of things. This is important. Decision making authority under the control of true civilians that have been elected by the people and are from the people, not some sort of zigzag uh, derivation uh, deriving from the military. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you, so again, in line with elections and being elected truly by the people, the upper house of the Senate right now is a military appointed Senate, if I'm not wrong. Does that need yes. to change in order for Thailand to actually have a true civil control of the military? So the, the Senate that Thailand has now is another masquerade yeah. whereby the military is able to maintain power. That constitution of 2017 that was endorsed by the military and the monarchy ensured that there was going to be a 100% uh, military dominated Senate. And that Senate then has to approve who becomes prime minister. Yeah. Okay. So it's, you know, if you read between the lines of the Constitution, the Constitution creates a charade democracy. The, the Constitution of Thailand thus does not really allow for true civilian control, civilian supremacy over the Thai politi political system, okay? Um, as I said before, the uh, end of the junta was simply the continuation of military power by other means, okay? And that's what's going on. All right. I want to take a step back now because we've spoken a bit about the military and we've spoken more about internal security in Thailand and how the military is organized. I want to talk a bit about yeah. external security in Thailand because you mentioned border tensions on the Laos Thailand border, the Cambodian Thailand border, and a bit about the southern insurgency. What are the external threats to Thai security today? External threats to Thai security. Uh, I don't see any external threats to Thai security today. And uh, if you look in the past, what the security needs of Thailand were, um, well, if we look during the Cold War, okay, the cold, during the Cold War, the, Thailand was a uh, close ally of the United States, and the United States formally took care of Thailand's external security needs, yeah. okay? Did Thailand have any uh, uh, external threats during the Cold War? Yes, of course it did, because Lao was communist and Thailand was fighting a communist insurrection. Uh, the Chinese communists were paying money into the Communist Party of Thailand. Yes, that was troublesome. Also, there were Cambodian communists, okay? Then not too far away, Vietnamese communists. Yes, that was then, but this is now. So at the end of the Cold War, uh, the, as uh, Cha, uh, the famous Thai Prime Minister Cha Chai Chunaban said, we're going to turn battlefields into a marketplace. And so now Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Myanmar have become part of the market of uh, mainland Southeast Asia that Thailand is part of the, the CLMV countries, okay? Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it is true that, uh, you know, borders have not all been uh, mark demarcated. There's not been a demarcation of all the borders that in fact, from between 2008 and 2014, Cambodia was creating some problems for Thailand along the borders but that's, that's also finished, okay? Um, so what is the problem, the external security problems? Uh, none, okay? That there are two security problems that Thailand has today. One is an internal security problem in the deep south where there is this Malay Muslim insurrection, okay? 
There is also a problem of regime security because many, many people don't like the continuation of this military junta, which is now called an elected government, okay? Uh, <laughs> so I think that uh, these are the two problems. And of course, among the demonstrators, there are some who are upset at monarchy. So if you wanna add that in there, a continuation of security problems for for the palace all right and what are the sentiments of the center or the military specifically towards the insurgency in the deep south and the malay muslim insurgency how are they dealing with it how have they dealt with it in the past is there any peaceful dialogue yes there is dialogue but actually i've talked to several military officials including the current fourth army commander and there is division among senior Thai military about how to deal with the insurgency. So of course, you can find these ultra right wing, ultra reactionary Thai military who are like, let's use the Sri Lankan model and just kill them all. And uh, I've heard some very senior people say that, okay? Over, over some beers, of course. Uh, I hope they were not serious, but um, there is that sentiment. Um, and in fact, uh, Army Commander Chai Sitisat went down to the Deep South in 2017 and reportedly told mid-ranking officers not to worry about human rights, just to win at any cost, okay? So there are certainly some sentiment like this, um, but at the same time, there are, there are also more moderate and reformist Thai military officers who have really supported negotiations. Negotiations, of course, at the elite level with the leaders of the BRN, leaders of the, um, of the major um, uh, insurrectionary group, okay? One of the big problems in the Deep South is that when there is an insurgent bombing, there's no claim of responsibility, okay? Not like in the Middle East where people say, hey, I did that, you know? <laughs> But in, in Thailand, they don't do that usually. Uh, and also, there tends to be this problem of different factions among the insurgent groups, within the insurgent groups. And then, of course, there are more, there's more than one insurgent group. Okay, so there's a problem of the cohesion of the insurgency. Uh, of course, that makes it easier for the Thai military to say, hey, it's not our fault. I mean, we're trying to deal with this problem and the insurgents, they can't even stay united, okay? But beginning in 20, uh, 2014, 2013, I'm sorry, beginning in 2013, there was sort of this uh, unending number of uh, meetings between the Thai government and the insurgent leaders under the Yingloc government, okay? Uh, now, of course, after the coup happened, military coup, then the, the dialogue stopped, but then it started again. That was surprising, it started again, and under the military, it's continued working at this level, at a sort of elite level, between the BRN and the Thai military. Now, at the same time, there's been a, a number of civil society meetings between uh, Muslims and Thai Buddhists to try at, at the lower level to try to, um, how would I say, to uh, change the mindset towards um, a sharing. This is sort of a, a Galtung theoretical way of thinking, right? To try to change the notions of conflict 
uh, to socially construct peaceful thinking. And there, you know, I participated in a lot of these uh, civil society meetings down south. And they, they'll, maybe there'll be a game where uh, one, there's two people in a team, one's Muslims, one's Buddhist. And, but you have to work together against another. And it's actually very useful in that respect. Who's putting on these meetings? It's not the Thai government. Yeah. Okay. It's actually been an organization called the Berghoff Foundation. Okay led by a man named Norbert Ropers, who used to work in Sri Lanka, by the way. <laughs> I hope he has more success in Thailand. Um, but uh, it's been useful. But I'll tell you this, the, the Thai military in the Deep South has been following a policy since 2015 of supporting these negotiations and of course also supporting Berghoff's civil society platforms they call them but also increasing use of repression okay so you know a two-pronged strategy of peace and brutality in order to achieve pacification. Okay. And it's, uh, it's, it's led to this policy had, at, see, at first seemed to be working, but now, more recently, it's led to a more radical leadership within the BRN coming forward, a more radical le leadership. And so the, uh, the insurgency continues. Yeah, it definitely does continue. And uh, I think the last thing that I wanted to ask you about in more broad, it, bringing it more just all to just taking a step back again, is just what does security sector reform in Thailand look like? As in, what is the ideal security sector reform that is required in Thailand in order to consolidate democratic rule in the long run? Well, I would say, and <laughs> I will be normative to you, uh, what what would it look like? It would look really much more like reform if uh, true civilians, elected members of parliament, and members of civil society who are not even politicians, uh, including journalists, including academics, uh, and NGOs, were able to lead, to help lead this reform. Okay, so there has been security sector reform in Thailand in the past, but for example, when it's happened in the late 1990s, who led it? The military. Okay, <laughs> military leading reform might be, might seem good. I mean, they do know what needs to be reformed, right? I mean, they're experts, but we need to have outsiders. Uh, Outsiders really need to be involved in doing this, okay? And uh, outsiders who are reform-minded, okay? Uh, that really includes the, the NGOs, like in other countries, in the Philippines in the 1980s, not the Philippines now. Yeah. The Philippines in the 1980s, there was a big push for reform and there were NGOs involved doing it, okay? by the in the european union okay they were really engaged in european in uh, european union security sector reform with that in mind there is an organization called decaf based in geneva which is not anything to do with coffee but rather is democratic control of the armed forces <laughs> i know i get a laugh out of you not decaffeinated but democratic control over the armed forces. And DCAF goes into different countries around the world and helps set up uh, security sector reform projects. The members and the heads of DCAF are former military people in Europe uh, who are really working toward having true civilians gain control 
over security sector reform processes. And these processes include teaching human rights, bringing, uh, bringing in more uh, streamlined, less corruption, uh, much more efficient uh, militaries for countries around the world. Okay, so I think that Thailand would benefit from having decaf, having uh, more control by uh, international groups that do work on SSR, but also Thai military needs to allow its uh, true civilians, its NGOs, its journalists, and its academics to really get involved. Basically, civilians need to be involved in directing security sector reform efforts. However, working with reformist Thai military, because the Thai military, they have the expertise, but they need to be open to change. All right, makes sense. Um, in terms of international outlook towards the Thai military, presumably after the 2014 coup, people weren't too happy with Prayut and the UN officially condemned the coup and asked for a reversion back to democracy. What is international bodies outlook towards Prayut's prime ministership right now? You mean, what is the, what do international bodies think about his prime premiership right now? Is that what you were asking? Yep. Yep. Uh, well, most international bodies are criticizing Prayut because, I mean, he, he's obviously a militarist who's looking to stay in power in any way he can, okay? Um, that being said, not all governments have been that critical of Prayut, clearly, okay? Uh, I mean, the United States, China, Russia have really seen Prayut in terms of the geopolitical picture. Okay. okay? And when I say the United States, I'm really talking since Donald Trump became president. Um, so with that in mind then, uh, specifically with the changing geopolitical uh, equilibrium, you know, in the world, you know, China and the United States specifically have been trying to, you know, play Prayut over to their side, okay? So there hasn't been as much criticism but there's been criticism of Prayut from the, uh, the, uh, the UNHCR, for example, uh, because when the 2014 coup happened, many, many Thai people were imprisoned because it was said that they needed to be undergo attitude adjustment. I'm sorry, your attitude needs to be adjusted. You're coming with me. Okay, that sounds like 1984. Yeah. And uh, there were individuals coming out of attitude adjustment who had uh, evidence of torture. There was at least one inv individual who was electrocuted. Okay. And uh, so this is uh, against human rights and uh, international organizations were very critical of the junta and Prayut was the face of the junta. Uh, so there has been much criticism of him, okay? There has also been criticism of uh, Prayut in terms of the corruption under the junta, Transparency International. So, I mean, I was the one that wrote the transparency report on the junta. Um, but <laughs> there's been a lot of corruption and one bit of corruption concerned deputy junta leader uh, Prawit Wongsawan, because it was seen that he was wearing all of these luxury watches that he never declared. Okay, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, certainly, I mean, the problem is there's no, there's a lack of impunity. Okay, there's, I'm sorry, there's just total impunity. <laughs> it's just total impunity. And um, there's, there's, it's a totally opaque situation. Lack of transparency is what I wanted to say. And uh, as a result, 
um, human rights violations, corruption, uh, military authoritarianism, uh, arrests, numerous arrests made. Other criticisms, for example, were that after the coup happened, uh, there was a change in the powers of the judicial system, of the, the courts. So what became the number one court in the country was the military court. Civilians being tried in military courts, okay? Another interesting thing that happened after the coup of 2014 was that um, all of the state corporations came under the control of Priyut, okay? as the leader of the junta. Well, such a situation is open to all kinds of abuse. Yeah. Abuse that did happen. <laughs> so uh, you can just see that the, there were a lot of problems and international organizations were critical indeed. Okay, perfect. Um, so what next for Thailand? Do you see the protesters' demands being met anytime soon? And do you see another military coup, importantly, anytime soon? I know this is hypothetical, but what would you be <laughs> guess on? Well, that's a good question because we have to, you know, consider the future. Um, well, I think that, that, you know, the demonstrations that have begun since July are going to continue growing and continue happening with more frequency and in more parts of Thailand. I wouldn't say these demonstrations are just limited and it's, it's gonna just end, but I think the uh, government is uh, responding very, very carefully and maybe that's smart. So what has been the policy of this government has been to try to wait out the demonstrators, okay? Not just quickly repress them, because that would not be smart, okay? Um, by waiting them out, what's it mean? Well, most of these demonstrators are high school demonstrators. It's something that's never really been seen before. High school students and then university students began to join them and and then tomorrow there will be these red shirt demonstrators joining them. And red shirts were sort of the group that's very close to Tox and Chinawat. But still the core is the high school demonstrators. Now, if you can wait out the demonstrators, wait and say, okay, maybe next month or maybe next year we'll get down to this, okay? Well, that means the leadership of the demonstrators, they have to somehow keep galvanizing the protesters together. And uh, it's difficult to do. At the same time, the government has been sending officials out to threaten uh, schools and universities to keep their students home, keep them speaking out. Also, uh, military officials have been going to the homes of students to tell their parents that they should not have their kids go out and do this, okay? So this has been sort of uh, a, uh, how would you say, a complex policy of trying to keep the demonstrations at bay. Of course, other, other strategies have been to take legal action against some of the leadership. And I think if it continues on, if the demonstrations continue on, despite these strategies, then um, there will be more arrests. There could even be disappearances of some of these students, okay? Specifically those students who criticize the monarchy. Because not all students, not all of the demonstrators are united in criticizing monarchy. Some just want an end to this quasi-military government. Yeah. Others, and I would say a less number of the demonstrators, they want an end to unabridged monarchical power. Okay, but that's not all of them. So um, the ultimate uh, response of the state will be to use repression. 
I don't think that's going to happen tomorrow. I could be wrong, but I think that would not help the government. Okay, if there is repression, it's just going to exacerbate the anger of people who are exhausted with the lack of real democracy. And by the way, the economy is going down. <clears throat> Now there could be, some people say there could be a military coup. Why and how? Because it is said that the aristocracy in Thailand and the, the top most aristocrat in Thailand, the arch royalist aristocrat is very unhappy with the dilatory fashion that Prayut has handled the protesters, okay? He hasn't taken quick action to nip it in the bud. And so I've already heard rumors that the army commander almost staged a coup against Prayud. And then the idea was that there would be much more reactionary military response, maybe a brutal response. Uh, yeah, that could happen. But here's the, here's the story. If the army commander overthrows Prayut, and then we have a new junta, what are they going to do? I mean, they're still faced with anger about the lack of democracy, the economy's not going well. It's better just to keep to prop Prayut up there, right? So uh, <laughs> I don't think Prayut's going anywhere for a while, but I think he's very weak right now. He's incredibly weak, okay? And uh, I'm happy to address that too, but I don't know if you have time. <laughs> uh, I think we'll say that for another interview or another conversation. No, I understand totally, okay. I'm, I'm happy to do another conversation because this is... <laughs> <laughs> I have all the time in the world. Okay, well, it's a, it's a pleasure being here and it's a pleasure being on your podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Are there any books that you can recommend or any documentaries that people can watch to understand more about the protest and what's going on in Thailand today? Uh, well, I think that, uh, um, uh, I mean, I guess you could look at... Uh, there is a, rec a recent book that's been written um, by uh, Chris Baker and uh, Pasuk Pong Pai Chit, which is uh, called A History of Thailand. Actually, the two of them write these books and update it every few years, but I think it's a really good read, so I would recommend that. All right, perfect. Well, Thank you so much for joining us once again today, Dr. Chambers. It's been a pleasure and incredibly nice having you. It's been an incredibly insightful conversation. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch.